And you're up. Okay. Welcome everyone to our webinar on succession planning today. Uh, my name is Stephanie Austry and I'm the marketing manager here at HR Strategies Consulting. So we certainly appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, and uh, before we get started, I'd just like to take care of a couple of very quick housekeeping items. So first, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please add them to the chat and we do encourage you to ask any questions you may have. Uh, we will be saving time at the end for any questions. Um, so uh, you will have a chance to, um, to ask us anything that's on your mind. Um, and we will be sharing both a, um, a recording of today's webinar, as well as a copy of the slides that we're going to uh, go through. So uh, don't worry about trying to keep up with the, um, the dialogue because you'll be getting both of those things. So no need to take uh, copious notes. Um, so I'd like to uh, get started by first introducing my co-presenter, uh, Dan Whitmarsh. So Dan is a solutions engineer here at HR Strategies Consulting. He has over 20 years experience helping clients achieve positive business outcomes through employee engagement initiatives, talent management process re-engineering, and adoption of HR technologies. So uh, today, Dan will be in the Batman role and I'll be playing his sidekick Robin and I don't mean to give you additional pressure uh, Dan uh, to play a superhero in this meeting I just uh, mean that he's really going to have the starring role and may or may not be wearing a very fancy belt. So um, for today's session, our plan is to uh, give you an introduction to HR strategies for those of you who are in, unfamiliar with us. Um, we'll also then go into the key elements of, um, of succession planning uh, and what's important. And then we will, uh, uh, Dan will take us through an exercise where you are able to assess your own organization's turnover. And finally, uh, we will talk about next steps. And as I said, we will be leaving some time for questions at the end. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So HR Strategies Consulting has been reimagining HR to get the most from an organization's HR investments for over 20 years. We feel that uh, since employees are the foundation of an organization, we specialize in that employee experience by uniting HR and technology to make work life better for all. So we have two lines of business, a human capital management practice and an IT practice, and we collectively engage them to deliver holistic solutions that align with our clients' business strategies. So um, if we can just advance to the next slide, thanks, Dan. Um, so if you have been attending any of our uh, monthly webinars or most recent webinars, this diagram will likely look familiar to you. So we've been focusing on different elements of the employee life cycle um, and how the candidate or employee experience can be improved. So we started off uh, in February and March looking at the blue joining section. So looking at hiring and onboarding. Then we, um, we moved into the pink growing section um, uh, and looked at how organizations tackle learning and development as well as performance management. And then uh, we took a quick uh, detour and talked about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in, uh, in June. Um, and all of those webinars uh, are recorded and available um, on our website. If you happen to miss any of them and are curious, um, please feel free to, to go and, and get caught up. So today we're going to be moving into the, um, we're talking about succession planning today. Uh, and that really is a bit of every um, uh, section on the wheel, as you'll see um, as Dan goes through our, um, our talk today. So with that, I will turn it over to Dan to really get us started in today's topic. Thanks, Stephanie. I appreciate all your work you do to put these events together for us. So our journey today is really going to be fun. 
Uh, first, we're going to understand some key elements of succession planning. We want to make sure we're all defined and discussing things and using the right language and terminology. We'll look at it from the three key vantage points of leadership, what they need out of succession planning, what an employee needs out of succession planning, and what does it mean to them as an individual contributor, and then finally, what's HR's role in the per in the uh, uh, planning or de delivery of succession planning. Then we're going to do an impact of succession planning on talent management practices, what we call affectionately the ripple process. I mean, how does this cascade out to other parts of the organization? We'll walk through some highlights and collections from the research and literature on best practices and considerations. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, <laughs> to Stephanie's point about being Batman, on the utility, bat utility belt today, we have another spreadsheet tool for you guys to use. For those who have been following us along, we try and give you something interactive that you can use as a quick diagnostic or a uh, starting point. And we've designed a little workbook to help you get started with that. And we'll walk through that. And then we'll eventually connect all this to, you know, what comes after succession planning. So without any further ado, Let's get talking about succession planning. So this is a, a never shifting and, and highly mature talent management process. And it applies to everybody, not just to you know, individual contributors or leaders. I mean, it happens at all or levels of the organization. There's CEO succession plans that are very dominant. Uh, senior management, uh, it seems to be more dominant at critical role positions, but it also cascades down to the individual contributor. And it's really elusive and a good signifier of how mature an organization is to know if they have or, or how well developed their succession planning is. We'll talk a bit more about that because it, as we said, it's one of the more advanced uh, talent management practices and really relies on the shoulders of all of the other practices putting things together so that we can make assumptions and directions around planning for succession. It's further impacted by the state of the economy. I mean, we're seeing, you know, 15 years used to be the average 10 year decline and it's now four years uh, with millennials, it's even lower, 2.8. So when you start thinking about succession planning, you know, typically we thought in terms of years, but now it's probably more apt to think about succession planning in terms of month. We're sitting on uh, 2 million U.S. employees quit every month citing negative work experiences. And I don't know if you follow the research, but we're on the cusp of what many are calling or forecasting the great resignation. You know, post-COVID uh, or as we're exiting out of COVID, uh, there's mass speculation across various sources that employees are going to make massive jobs, hops and changes. And if that happens, I mean, it's certainly really going to make succession planning uh, a critical element and could scuttle some companies if they don't plan for and prepare for such an exodus. Uh, and then, you know, further to the human experience management theme that we've talked about through all this WebEx series is if you don't equip your team with good tools and technology, they're going to leave. I mean, they need that. They want to have a great working experience, not be slugging through an old MS-DOS interface that's just awful black and white. So they need these great things in place. Now, we couple this together with, uh, you know, what we've got from Deloitte that tells us 84% of leaders that they talk about that experience being a top priority, but only 9% believe they're ready to use it. So if you read that Deloitte study, it actually alludes a little bit to succession planning as well. And it's almost a similar parallel. We're seeing numbers along the same ilk that 84% of leaders think it is a valuable practice, but very few are equipped to deliver it. So let's take that information and run into why this is critical. Why is succession planning so critical? because you need to understand what jobs are critical to your organization. I'm sure every one of us has gone through an exercise at some point where we took a critical role and did a forecast based off of lost revenue because we didn't have somebody in that seat driving that department. That's a pretty standard practice. So we take a look at those critical roles and we define them as keystone roles. And without them, we lose productivity. So having an empty seat at a critical role can be a dagger into a part of an operation if it's not addressed in a, a timely fashion, which is, you know, connecting, we'll talk about this in the ripple effect. Why is it so important to have timely time to hire metrics? Because if somebody were to leave, you need to have somebody there sooner than later. 
Uh, we're also adapting to demographic changes and talent scarcity, meaning what skills does the industry need from us and how do we, you know, do we have it internally or can we go out and buy it or get that skill or acquire it with new employees? Uh, you know, there's great research from the World Economic Forum that says, I think it was, uh, oh gosh, 56% of the population of what we know now will be obsolete in, you know, the coming years. So uh, we need to be really critical about that. That was from Stephanie Carousel, CEO of Upwork and member of the World Economic Forum. Uh, yeah, what half-life of the skills we have right now is five years, meaning in five years from now, the current skill set of your workforce will be as half as worth half as much as it is today. So that talent scarcity really drives things. Uh, identify skill gaps and training needs. So, you know, when you're doing your succession planning and we understand that Stephanie has uh, skills at these defined levels at a four to five or at eight out of 10 or whatever type of rating scales you use, and we need her successor to have the same type of communication skills or marketing skills or competencies. So it helps you map out who has the efficient the the competencies and skills to get there as well as deficiencies and do a gap analysis analysis of that so do you have the means to keep your employees skilled at the right level not just saying hey i think she can do marketing but to what degree can stephanie do marketing right uh, it also boosts morale and retention because you're investing in employees and employees have nothing more than recognition and belonging they want to be a part of the organization and a success an organization's visible investment in its human capital is a significant shot in the arm. And I bet that's not a bad COVID reference, but it's about being just a boost to employee engagement and morale. They see that the organization is vested in you, wants you, needs you, and likes you to be there, and then you feel part of its success. Um, we also, you know, for struggling to replace unique or highly specialized competencies, if there are specific rare skill sets in your organization, you need to plan for that, right? Succession planning mitigates the effects of that unexpected loss. So uh, we need to be organized and that's why succession planning is really critical. But here's where it falls down. It doesn't always deliver what's expected because it's a long-term discipline in a short-term world and nobody really puts in their calendar on a daily, weekly, or maybe even a monthly basis, hey, carve out 15 minutes for succession planning just doesn't get done, work gets in the way. But this is work for some people and that's the HR perspective we're gonna talk about. So work gets in the way of doing this. Number two, it can be destabilizing and threatening. So if you don't do this, and you, or if you, even if you do do it, but you don't do it well, you're gonna open the door for a whole bunch of problems. And the biggest problems are going to be uh, cultures of resentment and competition hey, I should have gotten that promotion over Stephanie or, you know, that person was just like, whatever the expression is of the day that I probably shouldn't use in a public webcast, right? But um, those are, you know, cultures that start to fester. And if you're not transparent in what happens here, and we're going to talk more about that, you can really make it an upsetting environment and an experience if you're not doing succession planning. So who's accountable for succession planning? This is always a debate. Is it HR? Is it my manager or me? In reality, it's all three of those factors. HR has to set the process and practice and found, uh, foundations in place, but my manager and me both have responsibilities here to develop this for succession planning. And then fourth, good data is often not available or ignored, and it leads to subjective decisions, which really plays back to bullet number two. It can be destabilizing and threatening for a lot of people. They don't want to compete for a position. They don't want to, you know, they, they, they think that there's some nepotism or depotism happening in an organization, and that can scuttle things pretty fast. There's also DEI homogeneity which can sabotage SP. I know that sounds like a big word, big phrase, but it means if we're all the same type of people and the same cut and cloth and the same experiences and we're not a world culture or valuing different inputs and people, you know, then anybody who comes from that other part of the world or part of um, different parts of the culture don't fit in. And, you know, we, we continue to strengthen and become a singular type of unit instead of a diverse unit, which is not a great thing to have happen. And five, 
last one, no clear process for it. And this really is because people view this as a cultural nuance and it needs change management. So change management is an essential part of this. And we're going to talk a bit about that because you have to have a culture that's ready for this and you have to prepare them and communicate around that. So conventional perspective of succession planning, you know, in the olden days, we used to think it was older people being replaced by younger people who were eventually going to be replaced by the youngest people in an organization. And if that's your perspective of succession planning, unfortunately, we're giving you an F, okay? No class assignment here, but that is uh, the reality and we don't, we don't wanna do this. The more uh, realistic view of succession planning is that it's a chess game. There are different positions with different values moving at different paces in different directions. And we need to coordinate this all together in a strategic view, not just act willy-nilly and, and tackle things as we think they need to be done. As we said from the get-go, it needs to apply to all levels in an organization. Uh, retirement is the biggest concern and that's kind of how succession planning was born out. But when it, it, uh, it has to come with knowledge transfer and talent retention. Um, title and or compensation. So a lot of times it's not about actually moving people up a pay grid or giving them more responsibility. Sometimes simple tactics of changing title or varying compensation can bring great pride to somebody. So it's not like you're actually giving them the next roll up the rung in the ladder. You're actually telling them they're on their way towards that. And here's what we're going to do is an interim gap to get you there by giving you a title, maybe some more responsibility, or just maybe a bump in pay. Okay, so these are parts of the process that we're going to look at in the ripple effect where compensation gets tied to this. There needs to be a common consensus among leaders on role readiness. I don't know if any of you have had the unpleasant experience of being in a larger organization and then seeing a colleague picked seemingly randomly out of the air and moved up to a different level. And if you know that happened because a senior leader picked them, uh, it can be a very derailing and, and uh, excruciatingly painful experience. It really can be. We don't want that to happen. There has to be honest investigation and consensus on what leaders want and how decision criteria are made to move people up into a system or else we're going to go back to that bullet number two on the last slide around the culture of resentment so let's look at this from three perspectives number one the leadership perspective number two employee perspective and then finally from hr's perspective uh steph any questions or comments as we we get into this and start to open it up a little further no, so far uh, there hasn't been anything added to the chat, but um, that's a good reminder. If people do have questions, please um, feel free to add them to the chat as we go through this. Awesome. Okay, thank you. So let's start with the leadership perspective. This is often thought of as, quote, bench strength. I mean, it's where the senior executive team looks down the organization at critical roles that they've defined, and they need to say, well, geez, if somebody were to unfortunately be hit by a bus or pull an early or win the lottery um, you know what are we going to do to replace them who's ready on that bench that can step up into the role so this needs to be driven by performance management performance management as if you've been following the series is driven by skills and competencies and evaluating ratings of people who have achieved skills and competencies to be successful in a role so we need to understand, hey, Stephanie has communication skills level four. That's a requirement for this critical role. She has uh, you know, business insight at level three, which is required. She has uh, you know, uh, organized teamwork organizational skills at level four to five. We need those things in place. So when you define just not the role, you have to define the required skills and competencies and the levels of which that person needs to have to be in that role. And that allows for a roadmap to cascade up and down the organization. So then we think about the second bullet. What is the domino effect? So if we move the green guy up here into the blue spot, uh, suddenly that leaves a vacancy in the green guy and we get the light green and red person down here. And are any of them ready to move up into that other role? Because we can't have a role, you know, pull somebody up and not backfill the role that's been left behind. So you need to understand the cascade effect or the domino effect behind the positions as we go through this. 
sometimes when you're looking at this org structure and we move the green guy here up into the blue position um, and we don't have yellow or red here ready. So then we need to think, well, how fast can we go outside to our recruiting? And we'll talk a bit about that in the ripple effect as well. Can we get that person from outside the organization and bring them in, right? Do we have the right learning content to play? So if we identify communication, uh, team overviews, teamwork, collaborative skills as the three key fundamental pieces for Stephanie's position, and then um, you know, as we go to move uh, these people up, they don't have them, but there's no way for them to get those skills. And we didn't put the right learning content in place. We're shooting ourselves in the foot. We're saying, hey, we need people with these skills, but you're not giving them the means to acquire those skills. So the learning content needs to be in place. And then having the skills and competencies to do a job to a performed or degree agreed upon level is probably the single most important part, but to couple with it, you need to have experience and mentorship really becomes a key factor here. So is there a mentorship program for people to come into and say, hey, you've got these skills, but there's a whole nuance that's going to happen now executing operations at this level in an organization and you need to be aware of it. And I'm going to be a mentor to you and I'm going to tell you how to navigate that and deal with those new challenges that you might not yet be accustomed to. And then finally, is compensation connected to the role or to the performance. And ideally it needs to be connected to both, right? So, you know, is compensation here going to jump all the way up to that person? No, they're gonna come into the entry point. So that's where pay grades, pay ranges, salary levels and whatnot become part of the play. But they're influenced by performance. Okay. Number two of three, the employee perspective, often thought of as career development. This is a little different. This isn't where the large organization looks down and says, who's coming up? This is where an individual starts in a beginner's role or an, an individual contributor role and looks up and says, what do I wanna be when I grow up? Like how, what's my future here in this organization? Because if I'm gonna stay at this uh, lonely desk in the mail room or wherever it is, uh, I'm not gonna do this for 25 or 30 years. So what we do need to know is, Hey, so if I'm looking up and I see a role that's one, two, maybe three levels ahead of me, I have to start charting what skills and competencies are required from that dream job, then how do I go about getting them, All right? So that's your learning management content. That's the talk we looked at from the top down, but from the bottom up, it looks a little bit different. So I need to go and shop for curriculum from the learning store that is addressing this particular skills and competencies that I need to have. And then secondly, if I take that course and pass it, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm good at it. It means I've passed the test, which is the first part. But secondly, then I need to start deploying it and using that skill and get validation from my manager through coaching and feedback that, that I'm on track. Those skills do match and line up because it is going to be my manager's stamp on my performance cycle that says uh, communication level four to five that enables me to finally get along that path. Secondly, or additionally, who can mentor me? So do I get a choice to, to sign up and join uh, a mentorship group or can participate or see a day in the life? And how's the added responsibility that I might be taking on to get there affect my compensation, my daily work plans? So that's what it looks like from the employee perspective. Now, from the HR perspective, this is often discussed as internal mobility. So it's a whole different flavor altogether. So has internal mobility been prioritized? Do people even know where to go to look for job opportunities and development inside of the organization? Have we defined what processes are out there as critical positions? You know, HR has to be accountable for setting the foundation here. Do we have manageable cross-boarding programs? Everybody talks about the wonderful merits with, re with right reason of how good onboarding impacts new hire engagement. What about cross-border uh, engagement? You know, if I'm leaving one department and going to another department, do we roll out the same red carpet? If we don't, we really should, right? And then do we have a fair and transparent way to evaluate role readiness? So we've got three potential successors coming up the pipe. 
how do we look at them and then get team consensus, again, coming back to skills and competencies, to assess who really has the right skills and is ready to do this, and doesn't leave a gap in the domino effect as we move forward. I see some questions bubbling up there. Stephanie, should we pause for a second? Yeah, this was a, a good question. Um, so we've referred to that this is part of a series. Um, and so I just wanted to um, share some information with everyone. Um, although these are standalone um, monthly webinars that we've been running, they do um, are somewhat interconnected and we have, um, we're working our way around the employee life cycle. And all of those uh, webinars are available on our website. So if you go go to um, the website and under resources, um, you can um, get to the webinar archive and, and get caught up on anything that um, you are interested in that you may have missed. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. So let's continue on. So where do we start? I mean, you, you, you are participants of this event here, you're all in different sized organizations at different stages of organizational maturity, meaning you could be a new company that doesn't have process developed, or you could be an old company that has a very ensconced way of conducting things, including succession planning. So both your size and maturity impact where you start. So for younger or smaller organizations, you tend to focus on cross training for redundancy and protection from surprise departures. You just don't want to be left with somebody who suddenly exits out of a company and leaves a void in a position and nobody knows what they were doing, how they did it, but it was a critical role and it needed to get done. So key talent management initiatives here are really on learning, uh, on teamwork and supported by documentation of process so that if you do have that unexpected departure, somebody can step in and assume those responsibilities. So it's really a cross training opportunity. Now, if you're a little bit bigger, medium sized or medium mature organizations, you need to start defining critical roles and skills. So this is where you start mapping out the critical roles and what levels of skills and competencies we need for that person in that role. And then key talent management initiatives become learning and then performance management ratings on those skills and competencies coupled with rewards and recognition, which is actually, hey, this person put those practices at play in an excellent way and we need to acknowledge it and recognize it, and then possibly even start levering in mentorships, okay? So good things to consider if you're a small or medium-sized organization. Now, if we jump up to a larger and more mature organization, they need to define those critical roles, skills, and competencies, and establish bench strengths charts, career development paths, role readiness assessments, and organizational dominoes. So the key talent management initiatives here, are again, learning, performance, rewards, recognition, mentorship, recruiting, because remember, we don't always have that person inside. We may have to rely on a pipeline of people who could be brought in uh, through the recruitment process at any point, and formal tracking of all this process with technology. That has to underpin things because you have to see this as a living entity and give access to those three constituents, meaning one, the executives need to go in in real time and do that look down for bench strength. The individual employees need to log in and look up the organization for career development opportunities and then learning to complete their knowledge journeys. And then it has to connect to recruiting. Mentorship can be delivered through technology. The SAP platform does an excellent job at that. And then as HR, the third constituent in that lens, you need to track all of this and you need to bring data to the table that talks about how many career development plans are there, how, what's the succession and bench strength, what's the domino ripple effect. So all of this stuff becomes living, breathing stuff that we ingest on a daily, mo uh, you know, uh, daily cycle or daily occurrence, I guess. So common themes for all sizes of organizations and levels. One, you need to understand your critical roles. Even if you're a very small organization, you need to know if I've got a purple squirrel and my purple squirrel eats a bad, you know, uh, acorn and dies, I got to get another one, right? Like, where do we get purple squirrels? How many of them are there? What's the market supply and demand for them? And, you know, what, what, what am I going to do to ensure that I've got those purple squirrels covered and a new one on the bench if I need it? Uh, so this is really important for highly specialized positions, the purple squirrel analogy, uh, positions of influence, uh, positions with a long learning curve. So, you know, you might pick up uh, 
I've got a I've got a son right now who's into an apprenticeship program, which is three to five years. So the learning curve to get there is huge. Uh, it's it's not something that you could just replace somebody in a heartbeat. I mean, it takes a lot of hours logging time in to understand the dynamics of the work that they do. Uh, positions with experiential learning is main uh, is the main knowledge. I, I guess that's probably a better example of a long learning curve. Is that something that you might not just have a degree for or a, a certification or a stamp for, but it's about the experiences that have to come with getting to be good in that position and doing it, right? So also understanding that there's a culture of change that has to happen here. People have to be comfortable with change. It's not about coming to work and doing the same thing every day for the rest of your life. It's about, hey, we're evolving and we expect you to evolve as well. And not everybody needs to climb a ladder. There are lots of great opportunities for what's called development in place, meaning I'm still wanna just be this role for the rest of my life. I like doing this, but I've always gotta be better at doing it, right? So the last part is needing to be comfortable with learning skills and feelings of psychological safety within the organization. If you feel at risk or at peril or you can't speak up or you can't do things, you're afraid of repercussions for voicing a new suggestion or idea, you're not psychological, psychologically safe within that organization. And that makes it difficult for anybody to take action from a career development or succession planning practice. So let's talk about the common best practices. Engage stakeholders. This is the communication portion of this. Promote internal mobility actively. I mean, I can't tell you how many large organizations I've worked with in the last 10 years where I said, what's your internal mobility practice like? And these are companies with 5,000 plus people. And they're like, uh, I, we have one. And they didn't actually know what it was, but they just know that they have jobs that are available to internal people to look at. End of story. It's not communicated. It's not promoted. It's not shared. That is not contributing meaningfully to a succession plan. It again, at the beginning, we talked about this applying at all levels and it has to apply at all levels. And then, you know, launch a company wide career development initiative to find out what people want to do in your organization. That's a really, really eye opening experience to allow you to get insight into a one page simple worksheet that managers may do with an employee. If you don't have electronic, you do it in a worksheet. But if you do have a system, you know, you can upload these and record them online. Uh, and it's great data to tell you what people aspire to, and it gives you great insight about the engagement level of your organization and whether they see themselves there as part of your future. Second part of this is to assess your internal candidates. Again, I know I sound like a broken record. What skills and competencies exist? Do some assessments if you don't have a valid performance management cycle. Use those skills and competencies as the building blocks and levels of proficiency for your critical roles. Don't do job descriptions. Use what's called position success profiles, meaning this is what it looks like to be successful in this role and use that to recruit. Don't put out the laundry list of all the things I'm gonna need you to do. The successful person will have this, will contribute here, will do this, is very different than you need to do X, you need to do Y, you need to do Z, you need to do all those laundry list of things. And then you need to collect learning opportunities to enhance the skills and competencies that get flushed out in your assessment. So common best practices, conduct tests. No better way than to say to, you know, Stephanie, you, you, you wanted to be the VP of marketing. Hey, you know what? We're, we've got a, uh, an opportunity here uh, to take a, a three month term and try it. Are you interested? Yeah. Short term or special projects are really great opportunities to move somebody laterally at little risk to find out if they're suitable to work at that next level in the organization. We talked quickly about cross-boarding. You need to manage this just like bringing on a new hire. Who's the new team members? What's different in this role? What's happening over in this part of the organization? Because you may think you know it, but they don't know it, right? And then finally, be transparent. This really takes the sting out of that uh, resentment or culture of resentment, because if you're not transparent about who got promoted and why, it's gonna bite you on the backside before you know it, okay? Lastly, leverage technology. HR software can be invaluable, okay? Leadership gets that real-time look, employees get a way to do their career development exercises, HR needs to collect the data. 
So really, of course, the reality we all know is if you're not collecting data and you're not measuring things, it's really tough to improve it and it tends to just fall off the table. So put those practices into some type of technology. Of course, that's a big part of our culture and what we do and why we're talking about this. And we'd love to speak specifically with you if that's uh, something that you're interested in learning more about. Metrics, turnover rates in your organization, right? Why are people leaving? And then likewise, the opposite. Why are they leaving? But why are some people staying? Often called stay interviews. What's got those people to stay? And a staying because work is easy and I get paid well and I can hide out for three of my five days a week and not do anything. You got to change your culture. Something's wrong. There's no room to keep those lecherous people in that organization. You've got to get them out, right? Cost per hire. So this is including uh, related cost due to new hire turnover. So if there's a perpetual high cost because you bring people in and they bounce right out of the organization and short cycle, it's because you're not actually reflecting what it's really like to work at that company and you need to be more realistic and maybe come back to those position success profiles we talked about instead of a conventional job description. Time per hire, right? Effective succession planning should have people, you know, if you've got those purple squirrels sitting somewhere in your organization, you need to know that there's a pipeline of them coming and available should you need to move. And then plan positions being filled, whether your succession plan candidates were deemed ready for the role or not. So let's talk about the ripple effect before we get into some cool tools to help you, okay? Ripple effects, recruiting. We can't rely solely on internal talent. We don't always necessarily have everybody we need. So you need to connect this to an external pipeline. You need to move from job descriptions to position success profiles. Onboarding, we know its merits, we know its value for new hires. It's just as impacting for cross-boarding. Learning and development, we've got career paths, we've got high potential tracks, and we've got all development plans, even performance improvement plans. These are all things that really kind of fall in a hybrid between learning and performance and layer into succession planning. Performance management, hey, so let's rank everybody on their skills and competencies and enable a, you know, establish that defined list of skills and competencies so that we can use this for promotion and compensation purposes. Workforce planning. Well, how, how can you make a business workforce plan about you know, new additions, new plants, new locations, new facilities, new product lines without consulting succession planning data? So you need to understand all of this, okay? And last of all, keys to success. We're talking about searching for the holy grail here. The top reason employee, it, this is really all about engagement and retention, right? You know, we're doing all of this because we want to engage the people who are here working and get them to work more productively. We all know the connection point between engagement and profitability of organizations. And we also understand the engagement and retention connection points. So top reasons employees stay with the company is that they feel challenged with their work. 34% reported they're sticking with their current employer because they foresee an opportunity to be part of that future growth. So we mentioned that out of the outset, but there's no shortage of data to point that out. When you create a succession planning, it showcases growth and challenges employees to do more. They get a more positive outlook on their future and more likely to stick around. And then further, work is even more aligned to his skills and competencies. So I know I'm good at this, this, and this, but I, there's a couple things I'm not so good at, and I don't want to do those. Well, then let's align my work to do what I'm good at and just reap the benefits of it, instead of making me do things that aren't necessarily in my wheelhouse. So, so that's Dan, the whole, yes. Sorry, it's just before you uh, move on, um, we had a, a question about uh, when you were talking about the stay interview. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you get true and candid stay interview information? Because obviously that may not be, um, someone doesn't want to be forthcoming with, oh, I stay because it's easy for me to hide out for three days. Yeah, so the survey data is very, you can do spot surveys that guarantee anonymity because people don't want to report their truth to a manager. They don't want to report the truth even to HR. Um, you can engage third party players. That's a pretty big and common practice to come in and do some type of uh, assessment with spot checks. A lot of the research, or um, I shouldn't say research, a lot of the people who do employee value proposition work, the consulting firms and agencies, 
uh, and our partners at SEP24 will come in and they will do stay assessments to help you formulate what it is that's good and unique about your organization and differentiates you and makes people want to stay and contribute in a more longing way. So uh, those are probably three of the more prevalent practices. So again, uh, engagement surveys that are collected anonymously. Uh, I've seen even blind mailboxes where people can put you know, things through a slot. Um, pretty low tech, but still effective. And, and so uh, thank you for that. And one, uh, one more question about the HR perspective. So the question is, what do you see for positions leading these efforts? For example, head of HR versus head of OD or another role? And yeah. how, how structure based on size of the organization? Who should this report into? So that's kind of a couple of things there. Yeah, that can get messy because, you know, head of HR and head of OD, you know, at one organization could have the, the diametrically opposed roles at a different organization. So it's really about how your organization defines them and what is assigned into that individual's portfolio. It does honestly belong in a cross platform model, not with a single user. OD is usually where it resides, but it doesn't have to be. It should be part of every uh, individual manager to do a team report on, you know, the state of their uh, talent pipeline and talent review. Uh, and that should cascade up to whichever HR business partner supports that team. That information needs to cascade up to the next level, whether it's HR or OD, so that there's a holistic view happening amongst the people uh, and across the organization. And the two we actually are gonna cover in a few seconds might give you some insight as how you could use that to, to, to get to that team-based view. Okay, thank you, Dan, that's it uh, for now. Okay, so we're wrapping up here. Uh, search for the Holy Grail, we finished that. So a recipe for success, right? Yeah, who doesn't like a recipe? And I'm gonna put this up in text only, no pictures like those awful web pages that just continue to pop up ads all over when you're cooking and trying to see the recipe. So succession planning requires a process of knowledge transfer. That's the key element that we want to underscore. You need to use org-wide defined skills and competencies, and they need to be measured them measured during goal, goal and performance management cycles, okay? You need to layer in mentoring. You need to do 360 role readiness assessments to find out when an individual is ready to step up to the next level, not just by their own means or their manager's means, but peers who have worked with them. You need to encourage and communicate and trans uh, liberally around internal mobility. You need to be transparent about why successors got the tap. You can't let that go unnoticed because you're opening up and, and turning this upside down and into a culture of resentment if you don't. So let's talk about a new tool that we're gonna put in your toolbox. We call this the HRSC Talent Employee Loss Audit Workbook, okay? You can use this to deliver to managers. It's just a simple spreadsheet with some macros built into it. I'm gonna show you it in a second. And you can ask them to do this for their team. Now it's less than scientific, but it's very accurate. I've been doing this for uh, 15, 20 years in various forms, and it always produces some pretty startling effects. And I'll show you what I mean. And then you can actually collect these back if you wanted to and roll up for team results. And it enables you to start making plans, whether you have a big technology stack in place that does all of this, or you're a new or smaller organization that doesn't quite have this going yet, you can actually manipulate these documents to, to do them, uh, to help you start promoting planning and communicating your efforts. So let's get started. I'm going to change from the PowerPoint to, okay, yep, this is the workbook. So there is a series of tabs you can see where it goes through this and this gets, it sounds complicated, but it's really not, okay? Um, but what I'd like you to do is when you're using this is click the blue arrow because I built macros in to redo math on every step. And if you just jump back and forth between the tabs, you, you, it won't recalculate for you if you make changes. So it should take no longer than 10 minutes. This is the workbook I would suggest you give to your employees. They read through the cover page and when they're ready, they click the blue arrow. So their first step is to put in the date, their name, and, and then they list. Can you make that a little bit bigger? Yeah. And, uh, and just so everyone knows, um, when we share the materials, we will be sharing this template as well. 
Very good. So they would write in their names on the yellow squares here. It tells you specifically the yellow cells need input. And then when you're done, you cascade forward. Let me just make that a little bit bigger for you as well. So you can see here, it's automatically summed up. All right, there are 13 employees here. And then what I just need to do is my gut check around each employee. So Stephanie is gonna last less than three months. Um, and I just put a one into whichever column that I need to mark this in. Deb is gonna be within one year. Terry's gonna be within two years. Dan's gonna be within five. Sarah's gonna be within 10. You know, Alex is well over 10. And then vice versa, I just randomly plotted these people out. But each cell gets a, you just put the one in and this is what it adds up to be. So it tells you kind of your distribution of where you think these people are gonna leave or when you think these people are gonna leave your organization. And if you advance to the next screen, it does a nice summary and says, all right, so your percentage of employees, you're gonna lose 15% within the next three months, 23% within a year, 15%, uh, but if you accumulate these up, these are columns adding together. So within the first year, it's gonna be 38% of my force. By the end of two years, it's gonna be 54. Within five years, 77, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see how this becomes a real eye opener suddenly for a manager to think, gee, we, we need to do stuff around succession. I'm not gonna have these people forever. So just knowing this is a great starting point. If you take it that far, you're doing good work, but we can actually take it deeper if we needed to. So if we click to the next tab, it says, what kind of loss are they? And again, it's a yellow cell. So you need to pick from the little drop down list of voluntary, meaning they chose to leave the organization or involuntary, meaning, yeah, we kind of said it's time, your time is up here and we need to move you on and replace you. So that's an involuntary departure. So I would ask you to rate each of those people and whether they're a voluntary or involuntary departure. And then when we click on the little blue arrow, it starts to break out a summary of, all right, so my voluntary departures, uh, you know, here's my breakdown. I'm gonna lose 8% in the, the first two years uh, up to 38% in the next five years. And my involuntary summary is a little different, all right? Sorry, I clicked two tabs ahead there by mistake. Uh, my involuntary summary is a little different. So it just gives you a breakdown of the voluntary departures versus the involuntary departures. Now, then I would ask them to go a step further and say, rate these, is a successor in place, yes or no? So you just populate, yeah, if that person left, do we have somebody in, more, in six months or three months, sorry, do we have somebody ready? Or no, we don't have somebody ready. And then again, if we click forward, you'll see it starts to break out. All right, for my successors that I do have people ready for, you know, here's what my turnover rates look like. And then we have a similar tab for ones where we don't have a successor planned and it calculates those ratios. Okay, master summary just brings it all together with the type of loss, successor in place, yes or no, so you can visualize your data. And then we actually broke this into combinations, which was just a, a copy and repaste of the, the sheets, but it'll tell you, all right, so here's the voluntary departures with a successor. Here's the voluntary departures with no successor. Here is the involuntary departures with a successor. Here is the involuntary with no successors. And then finally, it auto cascades into a report card. So here's your turnover of voluntary departures with a successor, with no successor, involuntary with a successor, involuntary with no successor. And it gives you a kind of quick snapshot, six month view, one year view, two year view, and a five year view. And that my friends is a very helpful tool. And as I said, if you just get to the point of scoring and getting this summary so that your managers actually understand the potential impact of what will be missing from their organization in the near and far future, that's a great step. Now. So Dan, one, yes. uh, one question was uh, just raised about, um, would you use this workbook um, for those employees who are transferring to other departments or um, solely for when uh, predicting leaving of the company? Yeah, fair question. It's really designed to assess you're losing that person and leaving to another company. It's not taking into account the domino effect, which actually makes these numbers 
look worse if you consider people who are transferring up to a different division or different department. So this is a conservative estimate at best. Uh, and I'll tell you, when I put these numbers together just in this mock model, that was very much in line with what I had seen over the last 10 to 15 years in doing this with different organizations. So you're right, that's a good point. If, if people are gonna be not leaving the company, but moving to a different part of the organization, they don't really fit on this worksheet, um, but you know, it would definitely elevate your numbers. And I guess you would wanna stipulate that if you felt that the person was just gonna transfer off of your team, do you wanna include them or not? But you'd wanna make that rule apply to everybody. Great, great, great question. So what I also have here, is, uh, let me see if I've got this. So I've done a variation of this um, with a team roll-up. So your team might go out and do that and bring that information back to you. And of course you wanna do this in candidacy because there's nothing pinpointing that you really think that person is gonna leave, but it's information and it's confidential information about what you're talking about and what your feelings are around employees and the succession plans. But you could actually take this, then roll up your team. So you could take Jeff Hill's data, Ben Shriven's, Faith Marshall, all your team members' data and do the same several steps and just put in their numbers here. Hey, so Team Hill had one here, two in this category, two here, one here, one here, et cetera. And you would just populate that information, would sum up your total organization or group structure that you have, and then hit that little blue arrow and it calculates the summary for your subset or your group. You can't go into those extra tabs because you're de deciding whether they're voluntary or involuntary on an individual basis, but you can at least take it to the summary tab to get these high level numbers of what it might look like for a group of people. And so someone actually just asked that, that question, Dan. So it, it basically, it ends up being a copy um, from one worksheet into this one to summarize it all, all the data Correct. together, or from yeah. multiple worksheets to this one to summarize it. Yep. Yeah, and, and like, I mean, this is a, this is a, a variation off in an old paper form that I had seen used way back in the 80s. Uh, but, you know, we've obviously replicated to put it online and put some math formulas behind it. So it's here for you to play around with and manipulate. And it's there. You can manu maneuver this in a variety of different ways. If you're an Excel, you basic user, which is beyond me, you, you should be able to understand where these cells, it'll tell you in all the formulas here, what it's just math, what math it's doing behind the scenes, right? And you can adjust this and model this so that you're looking through it, you know, change your people up, change your gut feel about this as a manager and look at it and go, hey, I'm not so sure all of a sudden as I look at them all laid out on a sheet, it looks a little different than what I actually thought when I thought about individuals one at a time. And then, you know, you may actually want to take a copy of this sheet and layer it out and start an action plan. Why do we think this person is gonna leave? What are we gonna do about it? What's the intervention? Do we try and get them to stay? Or do we wanna hurry them up and get them to leave sooner so that we have a successor in place? All those things become relevant to you. If you don't have technology, this can be a great starting point. But if you're looking to do this in technology, we have all of this baked into the SAP platform. Not these particular lost sheets, but it's a great part to start. Okay. So Stephanie, mm -hmm. are there any other questions on the, on the list at this time? No, not, not at this time. Okay. Well, let's go back to the PowerPoint. That's the tool we talked about, the new tool in your toolbox. And let me pass it back to you, my esteemed colleague. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Uh, so thank you again for going through all of that. So just to um, circle back um, to the circle. Um, so obviously, we have now covered uh, succession planning. And as mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be moving into the rewarding um, section of the wheel in our next webinar in August. So um, as was stated a couple of times, uh, those recordings of previous webinars are all available 
on our website. So we encourage you to, uh, to go and um, get caught up. Uh, we do, uh, as Dan mentioned, often include a similar um, audit of some sort for you to be able to do some sort of assessment on um, the subject at hand. Uh, so there are some uh, really interesting uh, tools for you to, to play around with and get uh, a picture of what might be going on at your organization. So um, again, I encourage you to um, add any last questions you have into the chat, but I think that we've addressed everything so far. Um, so just um, to advance to the next couple of slides, Dan, um, we are obviously here to help you. We'd love to talk to you about um, any way that we can help you with your employee experience um, uh, objectives. So whether it is to do a succession planning or performance, um, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, in terms of the next steps, uh, we will be sharing a recording of this, uh, uh, of this webinar, as well as the deck and that audit exercise that Dan just walked us through. Uh, and we do encourage you to complete that and share it with other uh, team members that um, you think would see some value from it. If you would like to learn more about HR strategies and how we might be able to help you, um, yeah, our contact information is here, so please reach out to us and uh, don't forget to sign up for that next virtual event that was that I, I mentioned. So that's on Tuesday, August 24th, and uh, we're playing on a bit of an Olympics theme with the Olympics starting uh, on Friday. So going for gold, harnessing the power of pay, benefits, rewards, and total recognition. So you can really see how um, you know each of these topics that we've been covering, how they are intertwined and how um, connected they all are. So I think let's just do a quick last check of her questions. I think we're all good. So Dan, thank you again for uh, another informative webinar. And um, if you, um, we look forward to seeing all of you hopefully in August. Thanks Stephanie for all the great work you do in this series and these WebExes. I love the Robin and Batman analogy. We definitely <laughs> are a good team working together. All right, thank you everyone for your time today and uh, we will see you again. Thanks all.